Almighty God, you have hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Gospel today comes from Matthew 11, verses 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. But John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all that are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Even though 
some of Cross history have wanted to ban it, just like other writings and other books, we have something to learn from this passage. In January 2010, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it was banned in the California elementary school. Yes, it was banned. Apparently, Merriam-Webster showed real audacity and real nerve and insensitivity by providing a clear and concise definition of certain intimate behavior. And according to a district representative, they said, it just is not age appropriate. But the dictionary wasn't alone. Other books have been removed as well. Do you remember Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? Remember that book, reading it to the children? Texas Education Board banned this beloved children's book in January 2010 because it seems the author, Bill Martin, has the same name as an obscure Marxist theorist. And no one bothered to check to see if they're actually the same person because they're not. And then there is the diary of a young girl by Anne Frank. This moving diary of a Holocaust victim was pulled from a Virginia school a few years ago. And two Ernest Hemingway classics, A Farewell to Arms was banned for being too risque, while For Whom the Bell Tolls was deemed pro-communist. And a light in the attic by Shel Silverstein. This poetry collection was yanked from a Florida elementary school because it promotes disrespect and horror and violence, they said. For some time, school systems have needed to take a deep breath. Sure, there's lots of books out there that Americans can rightfully understand restrictions and probably aren't appropriate for any age, clearly. But the dictionary? How are kids going to look up the word ban? <laughs> you know, book banning is nothing new in American life. And concern about sexuality is usually the match that lights the fire as many of our church denominations, including the Presbyterian Church USA, would agree. The list of books that schools and libraries have banned over the years is astounding, and I'm sure you can think of all other sorts of books that have disappeared from school shelves, whether because they were thought to be too risque or they were felt to promote bigotry or racism. At a Presbyterian church in Virginia, the youth director was determined to address sexuality in a clear, forthright manner. Now, in case you don't know, the Presbyterian church has produced such a curriculum. And this was the curriculum they wanted to use in this church. And the educator told the young people that their small groups would be discussing an issue that begins with S and ends with E-X. <laughs> and one young man said, we'll be discussing spandex. <laughs> Well, recently I found a list of the top 10 signs that 
that you may not be reading your Bible enough. Number 10. The preacher announces the sermon is from Galatians and you check the table of contents. <laughs> You think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may have had a few hit songs during the 1960s. <laughs> you opened the Gospel of Luke, and a World War II savings bond falls out. <laughs> Your favorite Old Testament patriarch is Hercules. <laughs> small family of woodchucks has taken up residence in Psalms. <laughs> you become frustrated because Charlton Heston isn't listed in either the concordance or the table of contents. <laughs> Catching your children reading the Song of Solomon, you demand, who gave you this stuff to read? You think the minor prophets worked in the quarries. <laughs> you keep falling for it every time that the pastor tells you to turn to first condominiums. <laughs> and the number one sign that you may not be reading your Bible enough it's the grandkids who keep asking too many questions about your usual bedtime story of Jonah the Shepherd Boy and his ark of many colors. <laughs> Should today's writings be banned from scripture? Or is there something that we learn from this story, from this book? And I think we do. The passionate longings of its characters give us important insights into the nature of human desire and the nature of God's desire for us. God doesn't simply tolerate us, the weak and fallible creatures that we are. God doesn't just tolerate us. Instead, God has a passion for each one of us and a hunger to be intimately involved with us. The promises in the Song of Solomon are ones of new adventures, of new possibilities, and most of all, of a new outlook on life. And when we dare to open this book, we discover these things. I guess in some ways it's like the guy who fell in love with the opera singer. You know, he hardly knew her, and since his only view of her was at the opera, through binoculars, from the third balcony, but he was convinced that he could live happily ever after married to a voice like that. And so Mary did. He scarcely noticed that she was considerably older than he, nor did he care that she walked with a limb. Her mezzo-soprano voice could take them through whatever came. And so after their marriage, there they were on their honeymoon together, and she began to prepare for their first night together. And as he watched, his chin dropped to his chest. She plucked out her glass eye and popped it in a container on the nightstand. She pulled off her wig, ripped off her false eyelashes, yanked out her dentures, unstrapped her artificial leg, and smiled at him as she slipped off her glasses that hid her hearing aid. And stunned and horrified, he gasped, for goodness sakes, woman, sing, sing, sing. <laughs> the journey of God's people from the book of Genesis onward has always included the adventure of entering new territory, of seeking and finding partners, falling in love and building a family, of being refreshed.
refreshed as the Gospel of Matthew tells us this morning. Our journey brings possibilities. Jesus knew that many religious people have a problem with the sensual parts of life. For he was no ascetic. He ate and drank with friends. He enjoyed the pleasures of touch and taste and smell and sight. No, he never got it all right. Because as we heard in Matthew, when Jesus' critics saw him eating and drinking, they said, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus understood that there were possibilities for connections across the dinner table. He practiced radical hospitality, welcoming, welcoming sinners and outcasts to break bread with him so that they could discover that God desires a deep and personal relationship with them. God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world, but to save them. And in the process, we gain a new outlook on life. We gain a new outlook on life. When we imagine Christ leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills, we see a Messiah with a burning desire to be with us. When we read of a servant crossing a desert, crossing this desert to find a wife or a savior that reaches across the table to welcome us. We understand that our God is doing everything possible to make a connection with us. And such is what we're going to share in just a few minutes as we come and we sit at the table. You know, my friends, the realization is, is that we have this new outlook on life, one in which we see ourselves as people whom Jesus desires, not just accepts, but desires. The theologian Phil Schrill has written a commentary on the Song of Solomon, and it's entitled, A Love Story Gone Awry. And she suggests that the garden imagery in the Song of Solomon is the recreation of the Garden of Eden before the fall. It is an ode to erotic love that describes what could have been and can be again. Triple does a comparison between the Garden of Eden and this recreated garden of today's passage. In the Garden of Eden, we find intimacy entangled with guilt and judgment and shameful nudity. In the Song of Solomon, we find love woven with play and imagination and delight. There is no guilt found anywhere. In Genesis, we find pain and childbirth unequal power between the lovers, and a suggestion that adult love demands leaving one's father and one's mother. But in the garden of today's passage, we find a different story of relationship that is rich in mutuality of power and passion. Though God is never named in the Song of Solomon, there is God's delight and God's creativity that saturates every verse and are embedded in each word. We are his love. We are his fair one, the one that he invites to come away, enjoy eternal life with me. In the words of the Song of Solomon, Jesus says, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. He invites us to show ourselves. He invites us 
to speak to Him. He invites us to spend our life with Him. This is God's passionate longing. And we are to surrender to His desire, to surrender to His passionate longing, and to never, never, ever bend. 